Hi everybody, this is Philip Martin, and this is the last on film, on video of 2021. It is, as you're watching this, the earliest time you can watch this, unless you... No, I think the earliest time you can watch it now, because we close that loophole, uh, is New Year's Eve. So, be safe. Um, any number of ways you can take that, I guess. I mean, sort of like, I mean, don't... Uh, do anything stupid on New Year's Eve because there's plenty of people out there willing to do that. Um, this is probably going to be a pretty brief um, episode of this. I don't have anything planned. Not that I usually do. I mean, I've got to start doing this better. That's one of my New Year's resolutions is I'm going to spend more time planning and maybe even editing this um, video, which you know, serves kind of like as our... Uh, I don't know, our, our space for people who don't like to read, I guess. But anyway, um, I want to thank some people. That's the main thing that I wanted to come on here today. I want to talk about the people that have worked all year to bring you this product. Um, and I hope I don't leave anybody out, but if I do, I'll get them before the end of the, end of the thing, I think. Uh, Stan Dimon is our page designer, and he's the reason that... We look so good in print and on the um, the iPad. Stan's been working with us for, for several years now, five or six, maybe even longer than that. These years just fly by, and I rely on him so much. <laughs> and I try not to make his life difficult. I'm sure I sometimes do, and we really appreciate that. We also appreciate Mr. Joe Riddle, our copy desk chief, and Emily Gist, who also works on our copy desk, and bring more than just a copy editor's perspective to this. They both um, bring some institutional knowledge. They both have uh, ideas about how we should say things. Uh, they are my bedrock. They're my backstoppers. Yeah. I almost said backstabbers, backstoppers. It's the opposite. Uh, but I really appreciate them. Uh, Karen Martin, who is our founding editor and still contributes to this section and lives in this house with me and is downstairs working right now. I want to appreciate her because she still does her... I mean, she has... The way we work, she reads everything I write. She, um, We talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, she's much more than, you know, just the columnist who who writes for the home movies for us um i want to talk about our we have four really good critics that i think give us a almost unique aside from you know like the big newspapers like the los angeles times and the new york times uh, i don't know that you've got another newspaper out there that's got as strong a stable of critics and has many critics and does as many reviews as we do. Uh, Piers Marchant, Dan Leibarger have both been working for us for years and they're invaluable. Uh, Dan, as I think I've said before, is based in Kansas City and so he screens movies there. Piers is based in Philadelphia, screens movies there, and he also travels a lot to film festivals for us. Um, Courtney uh, Lanning, who was uh, in Northwest Arkansas, uh, was a staffer, um, left this year, but and is working in Maine, uh, but <laughs> contributes continues to contribute uh, reviews and columns for us. Uh, Courtney's uh, younger than most of us and has a different perspective, and is very much appreciated, as you'll see this week in her top ten list which has exactly zero, zero overlap with my, maybe that's not fair. Maybe the Mitchells versus the Machines made my list. I don't think so. I don't think it made my top list, 10 list, but, uh, but, but she's a very uh, interesting voice and we're happy to have her. Uh, we're also very happy to have added Keith Garlington, who is sort of carrying this section this week. It's just the way it works out, because, you know, the stories that he, we had two of his reviews in the can waiting to run, and then he ran a, he, he wrote an essay, a year-end year wrap-up 
Piers will probably wrap. We'll probably have one next week. Uh, Dan will have one at some point. But his is running this week, so this is like the Keith Garlington Memorial issue. We're happy to have Keith on board. Uh, it has been an interesting, well, not quite two years, but almost two years. I mean, um, I think most of us are st are willing now to go to the movies if there's something we're willing to go to the movies to see. Case in point, the um, number one box office film this year was just released. It was just released December 17th. But uh, Spider-Man No Way Home did more box office than anything else this year in just that, uh, what, two, yeah, two-week period. I mean, it's just, you know, nuts. That's, that's, that's wild. As Keith points out, all four of the movies that uh, the, the four box office leaders this year uh, were all Marvel Cinematic Universe features, which bodes good and bad. I mean, I'm glad people are going back to the theaters and Spider-Man got them out. I wish the market were healthier for the kind of movies I like more, like, you know, um, Power of the Dog. <laughs> a grown up dramas. It, the, I don't have a problem, as, as I've explained or tried to explain many times before, I don't necessarily have a problem with the MCU or with any sort of comic book movies. I just wish that our diet was more balanced and that uh, we were willing to receive other kinds of, of product. And that the American consumer didn't just get out to see these kinds of things. It's sort of like, I wish that people read real literature or different literature, as well as the young adult novels that seem to, you know, have such a hold on a lot of us now that nowadays i remember working with somebody who used to read a lot of harry potter and i think that's fine but i don't know i don't know if it's fine i tell you the truth i do not know if it's fine i'm just going to say this you know maybe it's okay uh people say well at least they're reading something and yeah if you're 12 13 14 15 16 yes you're reading something that's probably good but if you're 35 and you're reading harry potter I get that you can be entertained by it and you should read what you want to read. You should consume what you want to consume. It should be fun. It should be a delight. But you ought to have developed, by the time you're an adult, you ought to have developed a faculty that allows you to enjoy something other than Fruit Loops and... Um, Cocoa Krispies. It's a difficult question for me. Because, like I said, I don't have anything against these Marvel, uh, the MCU. And I do think that they're smart. I don't think they're dumb movies. I think they're smart movies. I think that uh, to really be involved with them, to really get what you can't get out of them, to squeeze the juice out. You have to have this sort of working knowledge of the mythology, and you probably know a great deal about those those movies. Maybe you grew up reading the comic books. I think more likely people have just spent the 50 hours watching those movies and over and over. I think that there's you know, like 50 hours worth of movies, but they've watched them many, 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 many times, you know. And I think you develop this familiarity with the tropes and with the way the characters are supposed to be. And yeah, that's great. I just wish that our society applied that sort of diligent study to other things. i you know, good on you. I just, I just wish it wasn't exclusively spent on this sort of thing. Jason Isbell, uh, who's one of my favorite singers, and I'm not going to say country singer, though I almost did, um, 
was talking about, and several years ago, I think, he was talking about, you know, that he actually thought that some music is bad for you because it's if it's music that reinforces prejudices or if it's music that reassures you when you needn't be reassured, when you're being told everything's all right, when in fact everything is not all right, when things are very, very wrong, that's a problem. I wouldn't say that there are any movies out there that I think you shouldn't see. I, I mean, the dumbest, stupidest movies have some utility for some people sometimes. I mean, I, one of the classic examples I used to use, and I don't use it anymore because of what happened to Louis C.K., which is another unfortunate thing because it's sort of like if I reference a Louis C.K. thing now that, um, you know, what has happened to him, it becomes a political thing. It becomes me doing something I don't intend to do. But I used to say that one of the films I really enjoyed was Pootie Tang. And I really did enjoy Pootie Tang. And I don't, and I think I could make a defense of Pootie Tang. I could make a defense, just as I can defend the original Valley Girl, which was a movie that's so rich that I almost wrote a book about it. Maybe I still will. But, you know, I, I don't want it to just be Fruit Loops and Cocoa Krispies. You know, I don't want that all the time. Um... I want there to be a market for, you know, the Christoph Kieslowski films, for, you know, The Double Life of Veronique, for, you know, um, things like Jane Campion's Power of the Dog, which is primarily a Netflix product. And we have primarily... Critics in this country have primarily shifted, so we we are actually regarding that as a movie, where I think most of the world probably doesn't think of that as a movie. They think of it as something that's on Netflix, even though if you're in some markets, you would have had a chance to see it on screen. Same thing with The Lost Daughter, same thing with a lot of things. Uh, a lot of the movies that I actually thought were the best of the year, probably, well, I don't know if most of them, but probably a lot of them did not play in a theater in Arkansas. Okay. So, we have made the shift. The film critics of America have decided that, you know, we can consider these films, consider them movies, and we are um, not being uh, ridiculously, you know, hampered and in, 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 in insisting on having things shown to us on a big screen. Even though I did, that's how I did see The Power of the Dog. And I actually think that there's a big divide between people who saw The Power of the Dog on the big screen and who saw it in a more um, controlled domestic environment where they could stop it, start it, walk away from it, ignore it, change the channel, that sort of thing. I think sometimes you need to, to commit a little up front. You need to decide that uh, you're going to watch this thing. And... One thing that watching movies at home on Netflix or Amazon Prime uh, affords us is the opportunity to, to channel surf, surf and pause and, you know, do all that stuff. So the experience is different, and I think the experience changes the way we receive these things. I think that most people, if you watched Power of a Dog in a theater, especially if you driv drove to the theater, got out, bought a ticket, went in and sat down and watched it, I think it would be much different than the way that people are responding to it who watched it at home and saw it, you know, in this casual environment. Okay. <sighs> Keith is talking a lot about his essay, his lead essay, about how you know, it's kind of bleak that if, if, you, if you are somebody who is a chauvinist about the theater experience, which I think most movie critics are, I think most people who see a lot of movies understand that there's something special about seeing them in a theater. Now, some movies are more adaptable to smaller screens than others. Uh, Power of the Dog actually works pretty well 
on a home TV screen, as long as it's, you know, a nice TV and you're paying attention, you know, it's sort of like the, the lost daughter, let's see the lost daughter and power of the dog. Yes. Lost daughter and power of the dog. No, the lost daughter we watched at home. That's what I want to say. The hand of God and which is another Netflix film and, um, Power of the Dog I actually had screenings for. Now, there was a screening for The Lost Daughter, but I got a DVD of it, and I watched the DVD instead. And I can say that I don't think that my opinion of the film is much different than it would have been if I had seen it on a large screen in that environment. At the same time, I'm very aware of the fact that I'm watching it in the way I'm watching it. I'm very aware of you know what i could do and you know to be honest there's a certain discipline when you're when you're watching films professionally and you I, you know i have never walked out of a film that i was going to review or that i thought was important for me to watch to the end there have been movies i've been at screenings and i've left before the end because i had to go to another screening or for some other reason uh, but I have never walked out of a film that I was going to write about or, or say something important about. And I can apply that discipline just as easily when I'm watching something on DVD as I can than when I'm watching it in a theater, you know, with uh, uh, that I had to take a COVID test to go see. You know, I mean, it's it's a discipline. But you, But if you're just watching a film at home, you don't have that discipline. And you shouldn't have that discipline. Uh, you should feel free to turn it off. You should feel free to walk out. I just worry about this division we're having between like films that are ready for theaters, which tend, by and large, to be big blow 'em up, uh, Superman, uh, Spider Man, uh, you know those kinds of movies, those superhero movies, and. The rest of the movies, which I will admit that uh, we're living in a golden age. <laughs> it's sort of interesting that we can, this is the best time for somebody who enjoys independent film because it's really easy to see these films. It used to be that we had to wait, you know, six months, you know, or longer, and maybe they wouldn't even show up at uh, Riverdale or before that Market Street you know, which would have a few screens reserved for them. Now, we don't get a chance to see as many theatrically because so many more are going to television so fast. Or going, I say television, but they're going to streaming services so fast. Like Mass, which is a film that I've been waiting to run the review of because I figured somebody would open it. It never opened here. Uh, it opens this week, today, on streaming services. So you can see it. And it's great that you could see it. And it's great that you have the opportunity to see all these things. But at the same time, I lament the loss of that particular part of the culture. And I don't know what it means for in the long term for like art house theaters. Uh, Riverdale is sort of a hybrid art house theater. I mean, and I think that they've done a lot over the past couple of years, COVID. And every every theater has had its challenges, but it's it, I can watch because it's locally owned, mainly. Watch the strategies that uh, Matt Smith is doing at uh, Riverdale, trying to serve a constituency and also trying to serve... Yeah, he likes these movies. He likes, you know, art house, independent foreign films. And trying to bring them in is going to be a struggle from now on because more than likely... They're not going to be out theatrically for very long before they go to a streaming service, so they may go to a streaming service right away. And then, as a theater owner, you're faced with the problem of, well, do I put this in my theater when people can watch it on TV? And that kind of movie, people do tend to watch more on TV as opposed to Spider-Man. Okay. That's that's just my you know my little rant and my little rant is is that it's the best of times it's the worst of times, uh, the COVID stuff has exposed and accelerated some things that we might not otherwise have have noticed but they're coming you know they've been coming for a long time. So 
when I say see you at the movies, I'm talking about the movies. Whatever the movies are, I guess. Because now they're no longer strictly in a cinema. Which makes it challenging for people who own cinemas. And challenging for those of us who pay attention to that culture. Because now the culture is evolving in a way we may not have foreseen, you know, 20 years ago. I want to save movie theaters. I think everybody would say that. I think everybody would appreciate the option, the opportunity to go to a theater when they want to go to a theater. But I also have to admit that I really like being able to carry this with me to the gym and not only, you know, watch the Beatles get back here as I'm on the treadmill or what everything, but also to be able to like do my office stuff, you know, get my email and get my, and am I watching the movie the same way? No. I mean, a lot of people watch the movie with their phone out, which is wrong. I mean, don't do that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's the way we are. And at the end of 2021, 2022, we'll be here in a minute. And we'll be back. We'll see you all on the other side. Um, it's been a good year. It's been a challenging year. It's been a good year. Take care.